yeah, we, you know, we directed a couple questions that we wanted Blaine to ask and it was a super powerful interview. Some of those questions, um, one in particular, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was maybe like, what do you miss the most about lefty or what was your fondest memory? But it was it's a really powerful question. And I remember there was like 30 seconds of awkward silence and, um, Flip's wife had to step in and cause he was like starting to tear up and she had to say like, all right guys, let's take a break. Um, so it was a, a very powerful topic. Um, and I think that really helped. Uh, we didn't have a script. We didn't have this, this is what we want to do. We said, we're going to spend a couple days with Flip in his backyard, talk about Lefty, bring in Blaine who has a good relationship with Flip and, and he idolized Lefty more than most people out there. He, you know, he was one of the main reasons why Blaine became a guide. Mm. Um, so just putting together these people and asking the right questions and really just being there to capture it all, um, that was it. And then we throw all of our B-roll and interviews to our editor who has never picked up a fly rod in his life. And <laughs> we let him do the magic. This is Jared Zissou, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the podcast today. Got a great episode for you. Jared Zissou from Fly Lords is going to be our guest today. We're going to talk about all kinds of things, including the new film that he did with Flip Pallet, Blaine Chocolate, Bob Clouser, all kind of centering around Lefty Cray and his impact on fishing. It's uh, it's really good. Lefty Cray certainly had a big impact on, on my life and on my uh, fishing career. And if you are like me, he had that same impact on you. So we're going to catch up uh, and find out kind of what was going on with this production, what went on with it, how it came to be, and, you know, the opinion of it. We're going to get into some other things about uh, what Fly Lords is doing, bringing a tremendous amount of people into the sport and trying to do that in a in a responsible way, you know, talking about things like spot burning and ethics and etiquette and all kinds of things like that. Um, really good conversation. I think you're going to really like it. If you do, you can text me at 305-930-7346. That's the way that you get in touch with me. It's better than the email. It's certainly better than the DMs on social media. Really can't check those all the time. So if you want to get in touch with me, this is the way. Text 305-930-7346. And I think you have to just put your name in there and then, then you'll be talking to me. And I will get back to you for sure. So anyway, we're getting ready for this great conversation with Jared from Fly Lords, and here we go. Jared, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing well, Tom. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this. I've been a fan of Fly Lords for a while, um, interested in kind of learning more about it and how, how this all kind of came about for you, and especially, um, you know, some of the stuff that you put out later. But how, how did you start Fly Lords? What, what was the... What was the kind of motivation to get it started? What did you, what was your vision? Sure. Honestly, uh, in the very beginning, there wasn't too much of a vision. It was uh, essentially a new found passion for fly fishing. And I was a freshman in college and uh, it happened to be right around the time Instagram was gaining popularity. And I saw Lords of the Fly book on my kitchen counter and you know, was basically trying to find a way to fly fish every single day. And it went from me not wanting to annoy my personal friends with <laughs> fish pictures every single day to creating a platform uh, to share just general fly fishing content uh, on Instagram. And we were kind of the first ones there. Huh. And so where, where were you at this time? What, what kind of fishing were you doing? So I started fishing uh, in college. I went to the University of the South okay. uh, or Suwannee uh, in uh, Tennessee. So uh, 30 minutes from the school, we had a little tailwater called uh, the Elk River. And uh, it really became an outlet for me uh, to disconnect from school. And uh, I built a, a really strong passion uh, around that river and, and the sport. 
Nice. And uh, when, when you were fishing the elk, did you fish mostly um, uh, like wading or did you try? I know a lot of people up there, they, they like use different types of crafts from water, from uh, like paddle boards to kayaks to like anything that they can get. What was your method? Yeah, the first few years, it was uh, definitely waiting. And we found this little secret spot we called Red Barn and went in and had to put a couple dollars into a, a worm can from the owners. And we'd hike down into uh, some really nice holes. And I think my junior year, I convinced uh, the guys over at Flycraft to give me a, a deal on one of those boats. And it was definitely a, a game changer being able to access that river and experience, you know, what floating a river can can be like yeah did you would you use that same access and carry that boat down or would you put in like by the dam we put in by the dam and i'm trying to think if we ever took out there it was definitely i think we did a few times it was a pain in the butt to take out there so we i think we found some better uh some better takeout points nice and so all of that kind of leads you to to um start an instagram kind of account that's that's what started fly lords is the instagram just an instagram <laughs> and did you experience success like right away with it because there was certainly a time with instagram to where like new accounts would i mean it was much easier to get uh, just grow an account than it is today i don't know if that's your experience but it certainly is mine 100 percent. i call it the uh the wild west days of instagram where um, yeah, it was just, a, it was a totally different place. Uh, and, and you could scale an account much quicker. And, um, you know, like I said, being kind of the first ones on there, uh, definitely paid off, um, for being able to scale that account quickly in those first few years. And, and that was really our foot in the door is, is having an audience quickly. And then, obviously the platforms evolved from there and, and it needed to evolve. You know, it, it, you couldn't just do what we were doing early and still be successful today. What, what, why do you say that? What do you think has changed? Cause wasn't it the case with Instagram where like early on, like the, the years you're talking about, if you put a post out, it went to a hundred percent of your followers. Like everybody saw it. Wasn't that the case with them? That was the case. And it, I felt like it went beyond that. It was, you know, there was accounts that were discovering you more. And, um, so you're, you're totally right. You know, the, the algorithm today definitely only serves your content up to a certain portion of your audience. And obviously if a post is trending well, it'll serve it to more people. I mean, I think that's how they've created that kind of addictive, uh, <laughs> style of these social platforms is because they're able to use that algorithm to uh, identify these high engaged posts and serve them to more people. Um, but yeah, early days, it was, you know, if you had good content, it was going to all your audience and it was going beyond that to new profiles and new people were discovering you. Right. And then that's why you would get so many more, um, so much more rapid growth in the early days, but that's been the case you know, for us with every one of our platforms, if we're there early, it's far easier to grow it than, than, than later. But you said something kind of interesting. You said that, um, you, you thought that the platform needed to evolve because you wouldn't be able to, to be successful if it didn't explain that. So I think early days, it was, it was really about sharing content and sharing stories and, photographers and content creators were so stoked to see us share their stuff. And, and in those early days, we would share something from someone and send them back 5,000 new followers. And they were like, Oh my God, thanks so much for sharing. And you share someone's content today and it's um, here's an invoice for, for that content. Huh. So it's definitely evolved. And, and, you know, the main difference for us is we went from sharing content to creating content. Um, and I think as a media platform, uh, making that transition was extremely valuable, uh, especially for the long run, you know, of, of the, the platform and the brand. How did you, how did that decision, was that a difficult decision to start to, to decide that this, 
creating content needed to be a, a focus? And and why did you why did you come upon that realization? I mean, all the things that you just said or or deeper things. Yeah, it was probably a, it was probably a mix of both. Um, I've always been passionate about creating content. Uh, it started with Instagram. And I think a lot of people in my age group, it probably started on Instagram because you finally have this tool where you can go out and take a photo, share it with your audience and get that feeling of, Oh, look at all this appreciation that I'm getting these likes, I'm getting these comments. So early on, you got that satisfaction of being able to create something special and share it with your audience. And I think for me, that was being able to drive emotion through my friends and peers. That was really interesting for me. And I started taking some film classes in, in school. And um, I still remember I our first film project was uh, with uh, Will Taylor from Fly yeah. Shop Co., who, yeah. who you know. Yeah, he's a good friend. Uh, he invited us down and and I brought a videographer from my college and the mm-hmm. two of us went down there and we spent a day in, in Will's playground and it was, it was incredible. But being able to tell that first story and share that with people and edit it and put the music behind it, um, it felt really good. And I was also really inspired by some of the other filmmakers out there. Um, early on, it was the Felt Soul Media guys mm-hmm. who were making, you know, Eastern Rises is still one of my favorite films uh, to uh, Kamchatka. Uh, and those guys were a big inspiration for me. I still remember like mess emailing Ben and Travis and being like, Hey guys, can I have an internship this summer? I'll come work for free. And they're like, we don't need an intern. <laughs> they were super nice about it. But um, yeah, I know that's not the best answer to your question, but um that's kind of how it progressed. And and it was, we weren't ever able to create enough content to post every single day. So that was also like sharing some stuff, creating some stuff. And that's been the transition over the last three years is to be able to share and source now and pay for content and, and be able to share, you know, a hundred percent content that we're either sourcing original content or creating it ourselves. Hmm. That's interesting. And so this has kind of um, given you some, some good opportunities. Like the one that, that I like in particular is the, it seems like one of your latest projects um, with, with flip palette talking about lefty Craig time. That's uh, how did, how did that project come about? Yeah, that was, uh, it's crazy how fast things move at times, but um we've got a friend who works for the American museum of fly fishing, um, which is a nonprofit up in Vermont. Um, that's doing some really cool stuff. Um, but they reached out to us and they said, Hey, we want to reach a younger audience (laughs) and we want to partner with, with fly Lords on a video project to try and do that. And they said, we want to be in the fly fishing film tour. And I remember early on in those conversations, I said, Cause I, I worked at the fly fishing film tour. I did, I was the road crew for, for uh, a whole, a whole year with them. But I said, you can't, we can't guarantee you're going to be in the fly fishing film tour. Uh, it, it doesn't work like that. We can try really hard. Uh, and so that was how the conversation started. And, um, I still remember, you know, putting together a budget for this project and for the first time ever, you know, we put down a budget that would allocate enough to kind of bring all hands on board and and be able to create something uh, at a higher caliber than our other projects. And I still remember them saying, okay, sounds good. And I was like, (laughs) whoa, you're actually going to give us this much money. Um, And in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot of money, but for the fly fishing production industry or, or however you want to describe it, it was a lot of money and we spent every penny <laughs> making this thing. And I still remember the first call with flip, um, asking him if he would be interested in working with us on this. And obviously it wasn't, Hey flip, do you want to work with fly Lords on this? It was, Hey flip, do you want to work with the American museum of fly fishing? Um, which allowed us that entryway I don't even think he knew who fly Lords was. Well, he doesn't follow, he follows zero people on Instagram. So that doesn't help. Um, 
but I still remember that, remember that first phone call with him. I was with our cinematographer and editor, uh, and we had him on speakerphone. And I mean, first of all, hearing his voice over the phone, we were just like all starstruck. Um, <laughs> we've been looking up to this guy for a long time. And I remember him talking about time and he said, time is all he has. And I think it was in reference to giving his time to us for this project. And maybe there was some compensation involved in that conversation, <laughs> but that really stood out to us. Cause we're, you know, the, our team is 28, 27, 29, and we're sitting in that room, listening to him talk about time this way. And we don't look at time that way. We, time is, you know, a, in abundance, not quite as much anymore, but um, compared to him who has this perspective on time as this legendary soul that's done everything. And so that was really where the, the backbone of the project started was him talking about time. And eventually, you know, from that first phone call, eventually the project ended up being called time. Um, but that was how it kicked off. So it kicks off like that. Was the intent immediately that you were going to, this was going to be kind of focused on lefty or, or did that happen as you, as you start kind of working on the project? We went into the, the project, uh, and, and some of the guys at the museum thought that telling a story about lefty. So lefty had passed away in 2018, I believe. Uh, and we worked on this project in 2019. So we still, it was definitely close enough to when lefty passed away that it was a, a very relevant topic to talk about. And the museum has a lot of uh, great memorabilia from lefty, including his old vices and things like that. So from the beginning, we did want to find a way to include that story. Uh, and that was also another part of kind of that pitch to flip was let's tell a story commemorating, you know, one of your best friends and, and partners, you know, lefty Cray. And it was funny trying to, tell flip it was going to be a seven or eight minute cinematic experience was a very interesting conversation because he's like how do we fit a story about my relationship with lefty into seven or eight minutes i think this should be you know 40 minutes long and i was like that's not <laughs> what was the answer <laughs> Honestly, i was just like i gave him some pushback and and I mean, all of our projects are are shorter. And, and I don't know if that's just the evolution of attention spans. Uh, there's definitely still a time and a place for a longer film, but I think you can really convey a, a, an impactful message with a five to 10 minute film these days, uh, if, if you tell it right. So, And so did you have help telling that or did the, did you learn these skills in, in school or, or what, how do you, how do you get to, to be an efficient storyteller in seven minutes? Uh, a lot of trial and error. And I think honestly, like my skills are, uh, I'm pretty good at delegating and I'm pretty good at uh, finding people who are really good at what they do. And, and that's honestly what I'm passionate about is um, finding people that are really good at what they do and they're passionate about it and investing in them to, to tell the best possible story, whether that's the guy pressing the record button or the guy in the editing room or the guy who's helping us, you know, write the script. Uh, it's really trusting these people. And I've been extremely fortunate to uh, build relationships with, with our team uh, over the past few years who are just so talented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you certainly did a great job on, on this, this one. And um, you know, in one, on one hand, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy thing to do because you have such colorful characters in Flip Palette and Lefty Cray. But then on the other hand, it's incredibly difficult to condense that really lifetimes into, into a short period, whether that's a 20 minute film or a seven minute film, or, or even just to choose one picture that, that kind of embodies this whole story. It's so on one hand, like it, it's, it's kind of easy because I don't know. There's just so much there, but then that's also the challenge is that there's so much there. It's really difficult. So when you, when you start this project, I mean, you included Bob Clouser and Blaine chocolate and, um, uh, flip. And then of course it, the centerpiece is kind of, is kind of lefty and, and his, 
his impact that he had not only on these guys, but on, on everybody, people like me, people like you, people that are just getting into the sport today, even though he's passed on, he, he, you know, he left an indelible mark that few people leave on any sport. I mean, or, or even any activity like he, his, his, he, he was, he was a really special guy and, um, and he did some really pretty cool things and he, he got more, so many people into the sport. So when you're kind of looking at this, this story and you go to flip, do you just kind of let him talk or, or, and then choose the best pieces or are you kind of steering him in the direction that you want the story to go? He's such a articulate and powerful person. So when we sat down with him and this is how a lot of our projects go is, is finding that right time to sit down and, and do a really powerful interview. Uh, we actually had Blaine do the interview with him and the only direction we really gave was, you know, putting together some questions and honestly, they're not questions that I think were geniuses for coming up with. I think any cinematographer probably would have had similar questions, but um, yeah, we, you know, we directed a couple of questions that we wanted Blaine to ask and it was a super powerful interview. Some of those questions, um, one in particular, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was maybe like, what do you miss the most about lefty or what was your fondest memory? But it was it's a really powerful question. And I remember there was like 30 seconds of awkward silence and, um, Flip's wife had to step in and cause he was like starting to tear up and she had to say like, all right, guys, let's take a break. Um, so it was a, a very powerful topic. Um, and I think that really helped, uh, we didn't have a script. We didn't have this. This is what we want to do. We said, we're going to spend a couple of days with Flip in his backyard, talk about lefty, bring in Blaine, who has a good relationship with Flip. And, and he idolized lefty more than most people out there. He, you know, he was one of the main reasons why Blaine became a guide. Mm. Um, so just putting together these people and asking the right questions and really just being there to capture it all. Um, that was it. And then we throw all of our B roll and interviews to our editor who has never picked up a fly rod in his life. And <laughs> we let him do the magic. Well, he did a really good job. And sometimes it, you know, the, the, our editor on, on uh, saltwater experiences is, is not really a fisherman. And, uh, in, in a lot of ways, that's, that's been one of our biggest advantages is to get it into the hands of someone else who can tell a story, not based upon emotion of being all into this world or, or, or whatever, but tell it from a different perspective of like, well, I know that you guys think that's cool, but it doesn't make any sense in the story arc. And they create like <laughs> a story arc and then they, 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 they put it together in a way that basically anyone whether you're a fly fisherman or, or not would understand what's going on. They may not appreciate it quite as much as, as somebody that's deeply entrenched in, in it, but they, they tend to sometimes um, hold that story arc together better because they they're looking at it with fresh eyes, I guess, or, or different eyes. Do you yeah, do that? I, do you do that a lot of times with your, with your films? Do you, do you have an editor that is not, not, fishing related? Yeah, we, you know, this one, our particular editor that we've built a relationship on, I think we probably worked on 10 projects, projects with him, um, by now, but doesn't fish. And exactly what you're saying is he's a storyteller. So he's gotten better at like, Hey, this hook set is really cool. We should probably put that in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's gotten better at like understanding that we just, uh, we put out an Alaska film a few days ago and, and he really nailed the intensity of that fishing in the back country of Alaska. And, you know, so I, he's definitely developing nicely, but, uh, totally agree with your point. You know, you, to be a good, you know, editor, you don't need to be for a fishing film. You don't need to be you know, an, an obsessed angler, you, you can just be a good storyteller. And, well, and that's been a strength. For sure. Sometimes the obsessed angler editor can do both, but a lot of times the obsessed angler editor, you can see this in a lot of D 
deer hunting shows. Like you have these guys that really love deer hunting and they put together something that they think is so cool, but it's just like a bunch of kill shots, just back to back to back to back. It, it's like, where's the story here? It's like, there's no story. And, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's something to it, you know, but, but it seems like, it seems like the way that you tell a story and the way that you did in this particular movie time is, is, is really good. I mean, that one, that one was really good because you're, you're also, you know, the other challenging thing about this is you're, you're, you're tackling a subject that it's not easy, man, because Lefty Cray is such, such a figure that it would be really easy to get this wrong and do it, do injustice to, to this guy that has had such an impact on so many people. And you know, somehow you somehow you didn't do that. I think having Flip Pallet involved uh, certainly helped greatly because he, you know, has such a relationship with him, and then he's such an authentic figure that 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 really helped. But did you have any kind of trepidation about about doing that, about doing something about about this figurehead? I mean, it would be like, you know, doing something on Muhammad Ali or doing something on on. I mean, really on Muhammad Ali rather than Mike Tyson, but I mean, just like this, this incredible larger than life figure, like did, did that, are you, I mean, because you're coming to this kind of as a younger person, I mean, your, your, your motivation to get into the sport is Instagram where other people's motivation to get in the sport might've been a river runs through it or, um, you know, something 25 years earlier. So was that a thought about Lefty being such a big figure? Honestly, maybe we didn't realize the, <laughs> you know, how big this story was. I mean, we knew it was a big story. I think we were so focused on trying to make something for the fly fishing film tour. So we were, we were going back and forth with, a few people who, you know, we would show the film to, do you think it's ready to submit? And then they even gave us some feedback back on the piece. So we were so focused on making a piece that the film tour was going to accept and share um, that I don't think we realized kind of the pressure of not telling the story. I think our editor felt that he's like, I don't want to tell the story the bad way. <laughs> in a bad way, but, um, yeah, I, you know, we got, we got kind of lucky there in, in that sense. Well, good for you, man. You did a good job with it. And, and I think it did, I think it did lefty justice and it did flip justice and it, it, it brought in, you know, younger people like, uh, Blaine and, and then, you know, brought in old friends like Bob Clouser. I mean, it just did a really good job and you could have continued to go on down that, that line, you know, for years of all his friends and all the people that he had, impacted but it was it was a good choice you did you did a really nice job on it i really really liked it i thought it was i mean i was i was impressed with it i thought it was a really good really good film and on a on a very difficult subject so what really, do you got really going on now that. well i first of all i really appreciate that tom and and uh um yeah that means a lot coming from you i know that you're uh you're a legendary angler yourself, uh, probably one generation down from the flip and lefty crew, but, uh, it means a lot coming from you. No, well, it's, it's really well done and, and, you know, difficult. I mean, I think if I had been asked to do that, I would have been like, Ooh, boy, I don't know how, I don't know how we're going to do this. Like, it's just <laughs> such a, you know, do you start with, I mean, where do you start with, with lefty cray? Like that's, yeah. and maybe it's a good thing, you know, that, that, <clears throat> I don't know. He was just such a, such a prominent figure, but yeah. Anyway, you did a, <clears throat> you did a, a great job with it. What's going on now? What are you guys, what, what is, uh, what's the year look like, um, for fly Lords, you know, coming up? Yeah, it's, uh, it's busy. Um, in a million places just mentally right now, but it's a lot of, uh, sending, sending photographers out. We've got just, you know, this month we've got, uh, a, one of our photographers going down to Guatemala to shoot, um, some billfish content for a few days. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow to go up to Oregon, working on a, a series for buff right now. Mm. That's going to be coming out in April. All right. Um, and then we've got some work with 
not public knowledge yet, but um, we're going to be doing some work with uh, the guys over at G Loomis. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well. but some some content work with those guys. So we're going to have a, a really fun plate of projects this year. And um, obviously navigating COVID stinks. Uh, you know, we're trying to stay as professional as we can. So uh, I've got to go get a COVID test today. We've got our, you know, uh, cinematographer getting a test. We've got our photographer getting a test. Some of them cost money because they're last minute. Um, but we're trying to stay as safe and professional as we can during this weird time. And, um, the, the, the show's got to continue. Uh, so we're, we're working our hardest. Did, did you, um, make any kind of interesting pivots as you know, this last year starting, I mean, we're getting close to it being a year. I mean, really February last year was the Miami boat show. And, and I remember, remember there were a lot of people sick there. Like there were, there were a lot of people sick. And I don't know that I necessarily, I mean, there were, there, you were just like, Oh, it's terrible flu season, you know, but then in March when things start happening, I'm like, man, that, that seems like there were a lot, seems like there were a lot of people that were really, really sick at the Miami boat show. I wonder if that was COVID. And then the next thing, you know, here we are now it's in January. It's been, you know, we're, we're closing in on a year and um, everyone's business changed considerably. And here we are talking about how your business has turned into content creation and, and uh, you're sending photographers out and you're doing these, these films. How did not being able to travel and being in quarantine and, and how did all of that, how did you pivot or what pivots did you make to kind of navigate that in since March? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I still remember that first, like, couple months there of just being like, what do we do? And, you know, accounts that we had that we were counting on for the year just completely froze or left. Um, I'm sure you probably experienced something similar, but, sure. um, we had to be kind of creative and, and we started from scratch. Like what, what do we do here? You know, the first thing we did was found a way to launch a series called staying afloat. And it was, uh, an interview and Instagram live series, uh, with, uh, anglers and guides and fly shops that were all hurting. Uh, and we, you know, talked about how they were being affected by COVID and, and how people could support them and how they were going to get through it. Uh, and a series like that was nice because we didn't actually have to travel anywhere and shoot anything. We were able to create content through existing photos and communicating through, uh, you know, Instagram live. Um, so that was kind of the first pivot we did and, and utilizing that interactive, uh, platform like an Instagram live was something that, you know, we saw a lot of value in, and, and that's definitely something that's changed. Uh, and, and, you know, we're trying to do more of this year. Um, obviously it got a little bit better after a few months, uh, like into the end of last year. And we were able to get on a few trips, uh, and, and get out and, and go do things. Um, and another pivot really, cause for the last few years, we've been traveling to Argentina and Iceland and the Seychelles and Christmas Island and all these different places. We've been super fortunate to be able to, to work with some of these fly fishing lodges. And this year it was like nothing. We were supposed to go to Sweden. We were supposed to go to Iceland all got canceled and we had to put our um, eyes and our content towards the local stuff. Uh, and we just moved to Colorado. So um, being able to shift and pivot to us based content was uh, something that we kind of had to embrace. And it was tough, you know, doing a, we did a four part series for Colorado tourism on the, the local tailwaters here in Colorado. Uh, and we had to be extremely careful with, not blowing up people's hotspots and, and backyards. And, um, but it really, for me, it was, um, I did the whole road trip with, uh, another one of our, another one of our guys and it allowed me to see how valuable our backyards were and how we really need to protect these areas. And especially in a year where the industry has grown so much, um, it, it changed the whole model of what we're doing and the whole our the message that we want to share with fly lords and it changed from 
we just want to inspire people to get outdoors and go fishing to we want to inspire people to get on the water because those people are going to help protect the water. Mm. If we introduce somebody to fly fishing and we convince them to go out and check out a tailwater in Colorado, they're going to fall in love with it. They're going to catch a fish. And that's going to be somebody who's going to end up contributing to trout unlimited or to bonefish tarpon trust. So our whole message really changed. And, and I really think that was brought on by this pivot of focusing on our backyard fishing experiences versus, you know, going down to Patagonia where you catch as many trout as you can. And, you know, we're not really focused on a conservation message down there. Right. So the conservation message, do you have a kind of a a theme on, on the, the conservation message or is it just protecting the, the areas that, that we fly fish? I think for us, since we have such a large social presence, um, a lot of times we're, we're that first touch point for somebody who, you know, if somebody's friends getting into fly fishing, they might say, Hey, go check out the fly Lord's Instagram account, you know, and our goal on that surface level is to be like, Hey, this is fly fishing. This is how you handle the fish. You know, we're doing like a fishing etiquette series. Uh, and it's a really cool sport. It's, it brings you to beautiful places It introduces you to beautiful people. Um, and I think at being that first touch point our I feel like it's our responsibility to educate those people as much as we can introduce them to, you know, the local nonprofits that they might have in their area or local conservation groups that are advocating for their local waters. Uh, and just try to be, try to give them the tools that they need to be good stewards. And this is something that Philip said <laughs> in time, but of, uh, of the land and of the, the sport. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a great, uh, direction for sure. So, um, because there does, there does become a responsibility. That was going to be my next question is, is, you know, as you build this, this, audience and you're, you're introducing people, where does the responsibility lie to, to you teach them all the things that you just said to be a good steward. And, and then also in the etiquette piece, like you said, you're just getting ready to do an etiquette piece. How do you, um, how do you see doing that? Do you partner with, with, you know, young guides, old guides, uh, guides of different opinions, like, because there's a lot of different etiquette in fishing, you know, and, and, and it's like, you know, if you're, I mean, just take like a nymph fisherman and a dry fly fisherman, they have different opinions on, or a streamer guy, you know, they, there's all different opinions about how you would kind of pass them on a river or whatever. So how, how are you kind of getting, deciding on the message on etiquette? Like, are you partnering with other guides? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. We've, we've got a really solid team of our writers and, and some of them are, are past guides and, um, some of them are 15 year olds who just got into the sport. Connor was on our team for a while. So he he's been in some of those meetings, but, um, whether it's the opinion of an old salty guide, who's, uh, been doing it for 60 years, or it's the new guy down in the keys who might be getting pushed around and, and, you know, can't really carve out a niche for him. I think everybody's opinion is valuable. And um, for these etiquette series, we're definitely starting on some tangible, you know, pieces that aren't too clashy with when it comes to people's opinions. Um, We just did one on spot burning. Uh, So we're a couple into the series right now. and, And we talked about, you know, tips on how not to spot burn. Uh, and that brought up some really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's, let's find out what that was all about. I didn't read that <laughs> piece, but I'm just, inter- I'm interested to know what, what the tips are. Yeah. I mean, well, for the first thing we had to be careful is cause like people see us as a big Instagram platform that, that built our, our audience through this Instagram platform as, you know, people call this out for spot burning in the past, but that's something we've definitely as we've evolved, we've tried to be a lot more careful with that. Um, but things like blurring out the backgrounds of your image or, uh, 
I got to dive into the actual article. I was more focused on the comments that we were getting on, on uh, Instagram after we posted. And, and honestly, that's an interesting, interesting topic as well, because some people were saying the, their spots or, and I'm not going to go into too much depth. Maybe you could take a look at some of those comments, but um, there was definitely some people saying that it was almost elitist for not sharing your spots and that, all these spots are mother nature's spots and that people shouldn't be keeping secrets about their fishing spots. And <laughs> we didn't really agree with that. I'd be interested to hear what your perspective is on that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It, that, man, this is a, this is a very interesting conversation because, you know, as a young angler that doesn't have a lot of spots, you're so hungry for spots that you don't see why anybody would, you know, why not? I'll, I'll tell anybody where I'm fishing, you know, but then as someone who has been around a little while, you, you really learn something that other people don't know. And it's like, it's like wealth. It's like, it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a completely different experience and it's a completely different experience because people aren't going there. Those fish are not being pressured. They're not, um, they're not being bothered. And that's why it's a completely different experience. And so to tell just anybody about that, all of a sudden that's going to be the same as the rest of the river or the rest of the, the areas that get fished heavily. And then, then that special experience doesn't, exist and then it seems like at some point in your in your career that well the it's just infinite you can find so many more of these but then if you've been fishing the same river for 15 years you're like hmm, there's only so many there's only so many of these special places and so like my feeling is that i w i would never um uh, hold back information that would keep someone from getting into the sport or 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 like talk to someone in a way that, that they would not want to get in the sport. I want to um, promote fishing, fly fishing, all types of fishing as a great activity. But does that mean I got to tell you the things that it's taken me 30 years to learn, like on the first day? I don't, I don't subscribe to that uh, for sure. And then you have this spot burning type uh, discussion to where it's like, You've learned, you learned this spot. And so it is your, um, it's your right to do whatever you want to with it, but other people know this spot too. And so when you, you know, give it up, like the coordinates and uh, the, the trail that it took to get there and everything else, other pe don't be surprised when other people aren't that super happy with you. I mean, some people are going to be because they just learned a new spot. Other people are not going to be super happy because you just brought 150 people into this little spot that can really only accommodate one or two. So I think it takes some wisdom of understanding when a spot is super fragile and it, it just can't take that kind of pressure. And that's a spot that you have to be very, very, very careful of just putting out to public knowledge, you know, something that, you know, in a weekend it doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, you want, I don't know, it's, it's a tough thing because you, you want to encourage the, the, the less experienced anglers, but then you want to protect the, the spots that the more experienced anglers have found. And it becomes a real delicate balance and it becomes a, it becomes something that I think, um, you know, pretty much everyone at some point has experienced the highs and the lows with that of like, yeah, I showed this guy, you know, how, how to fish and gave them, gave them a spot. And now they're having a really good time. And that's, that's very rewarding, but then you can do the same thing to another spot. And it's like, man, I guess it kind of blew that spot up because I've never been able to fish there by myself again since that article or that picture or whatever. But I don't know. I would imagine that the, the comments on, on uh, social media are wide ranging on, on something like that. Definitely. When I think of this conversation, I also think back to, uh, did you get a chance to see that film 120 days yeah, with, sure. uh, David Mangum? So uh -huh. one of the best quotes in there and, and I fished with David and he's like, I mean, he's clearly one of the best harping guides out there and he's so intense. 
And, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes from him is that he's got this skull buoy that's bouncing in the water. And, and he talks about how these places are his intellectual property because he's found them. He's put in the hours to, to work for them. And, you know, that mentality right there, I mean, as a tarpon guide, he makes his living bringing people to these spots that he spent years trying to learn. Um, obviously it's a little bit different than a trout stream where there's only so many spots you can actually have as a guide, um, where there's probably a little bit more or a lot more research that goes into some of these tarpon spots. I mean, you've trout guided and you've tarp, uh, saltwater guided. So I'm sure you, you've seen the difference in those fisheries, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what your opinion is on intellectual property or, or if that's a thing. <laughs> well, it sure is for the people that, that, that believe in it. Now where David's fishing, there just aren't as many spots as there are in the keys. I mean, I've, I've fished with David and, um, it, it's, it's few and far between and you have to, I mean, the bottom up there is, is black as night. And I thought, well, I can see tarpon, you know, I, I'll be able to see them on, on dark bottom, um, at least a little bit, you know, because we, we fish them over turtle grass in the keys and you can, you can see them pretty well and you can see them over some dark bottom sometimes, but there, man, up there, it's, they're, they're just, you can't see them. I mean, it's really, really difficult to see them, especially when you get the afternoon thunderstorms and, and which pop up every afternoon and there's just not a lot of places. So I can certainly see where David's coming from of, you know, he, he found these spots that it's possible to fly fish for the tarpon. It took him a long time to do it. Therefore, you know, those are his and, um, that works really well when there's only a few people fishing up there, but as more and more and more and more and more people go there, I feel like you can only protect it so much, but then that's, I'm sure that's where he's coming from is that there's more and more and more people. If he wants to have any place to fish, he's got to protect what he knows. So I see both sides of it there in the keys. You know, if somebody's in your spot, you know, most of the guys just move on, but there are certain places that it's, it's a war zone. It's been known, you know, people, people fight, people fight back at the, at the boat ramp, they fight back at the marina. They fight out on the water um, over these particular spots. And, and it's the same argument there that they wouldn't know to fish there if they didn't see this other guy there. So I don't know. To me, I don't like confrontation on the water at all, whether it's freshwater, saltwater, bluegill fishing, or, or blue marlin fishing. I don't, I don't like controversy on the water. I don't like uh, confrontations. Typically they just leave me with a, with a, a bad feeling in my stomach all day long. And especially if you've got customers there, they like, it doesn't feel good for them either. Like it, it's not a good day. And some people don't mind it. You know, some people just don't, don't mind it. It doesn't bother them. And, um, but I don't, I don't like that. So I just try to find some, some other place to go rather than rather than you know have the the confront the big confrontation on the water but it, it's a tricky thing man like it, it really is because especially if you've been at it for a while you can you can definitely see both sides of it like you know it's not yours it's everybody's but there's also a way of kind of I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. That's why I wanted to kind of ask you about the, of what you put in the spot burning article, because it, it's, it's, it's a many, there are many levels and nuances to that argument, you know, and, and different areas. Um, it, it may be a slightly different article. I mean, our argument than, than others, but I would imagine the comments yeah. on those things were, uh, it was probably lit the, lit the internet on fire as you're talking about that, because it's a sensitive, it's a sensitive subject. Yeah, it's definitely a, a juicy topic. Anytime you have somebody who's very opinionated about one side or the other. Um, and I think in this case, it's more of that intellectual property. Uh, you know, I found this spot. I don't want anybody else to know about it. Um, there's definitely a lot of people that feel very passionate about that. Um, and then probably people who are like newer to the sport 
uh, which, which there's nothing wrong with, but they probably want, you know, there's a new, the new fly fishing culture is, is an Orvis is spearheading it and, you know, some other companies as well, but it's really inclusion and sharing and, um, where, you know, 10 years ago, uh, and you probably know better than me, but it was probably a little bit of a different, uh, scene out there. And there's definitely positives to, you know, making the sport more, more inclusive. And, you know, what I say to you is like, we want to see this, the sport grow. Uh, a lot of people probably don't want to see it grow because when they go up to the frying pan, their favorite hole is there's two people in it. Um, I I'd like to see it grow, uh, because like I said to you before, the more anglers we have, and it's probably similar in the hunting space, the more conservationists we have. Uh, and do we have to maybe get up a little bit earlier and go out in the winter to find some of these spots and, and solitude and fish? Yeah. Hell yeah. And honestly, that's some of the content we're, we're working on right now. Um, we've got a piece with Sims coming out, uh, in, in March, uh, with their new waiter line, but it's really about like going further and, and finding these places. And, and I think more than ever, that's, um, that's the truth is, you know, you can't just drive your car and pull up to the, the honey hole anymore. Uh, you got to kind of put in some time and research and, uh, hike a little bit further. And, and, uh, I think that's a cool part of the sport and, and something that, you know, my generation is definitely uh, embracing a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, a lot of times people will get, they'll have one at it, attitude about something and they'll be like, just share, share, you know, everybody, if everybody shares, then everybody knows all the spots and then you kind of spread out all the pressure and, and there's never, never too many people in one spot, but then, then you share with one person and they do exactly the opposite of what you might do to that spot. And they just go there every single day and just camp on it. And it's like, they build a house there and, <laughs> and now they live in this spot that you showed them. And, and that's when you get burned. And that's when the attitude starts to change a little bit is it's like, you know, I showed this spot to two or three other people and nobody, you know, put a lot of pressure on it. And then you show it to one person that feels differently about it and it's the best thing they've ever seen and they, and they never go anywhere else. But in that, in that sense, it's like, okay, cool. Well now, now you know where that person is and you can, they're going to be there all the time. So it's like you gave them an anchor, like that's, you're going to go there and you're going to sit there and that's, that's what you're going to do. So now it's easy to fish around you. Um, but all that, all that works well when there's a lot of spots to fish, but when you're fishing on small water or, or areas where the, the spots are really, really, um, kind of limited, that becomes a big problem, you know, and, and tempers yeah. flare and people get really, really upset about it sometimes. Um, it, it's one of those sports where information is so important. And whether you're getting that information from a podcast or from a YouTube video or from your local fly shop or a guide or somebody on the water, uh, information is so valuable in the sport with when it comes down to what leader you're throwing or what fly you're throwing and what size and what color with what little sparkle off of it, or, you know, how many split shots you're using. I mean, especially in trout fishing, obviously in saltwater as well, but, um, that information is so valuable. It, it makes sense taking the time to learn it. And, you know, obviously there's books on probably best places to fish in Colorado and what to use and things like that. But, um, it, it, it's something that intrigues me about the sport a lot is that you never stop learning. And, you know, a good example is we have two fly shops here in town, right before you go up the frying pan, Taylor Creek fly shop and frying pan anglers. And, when I go up for a day on the frying pan, I'll stop into both of the shops and ask them to pick out a couple of flies for me. And they're always different flies. Hmm. Um, so I'll have like a box with a few different opinions. And then when I go up there, I'll, I'll set up a rig with, you know, both of those opinions on, on, on a rig. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a cool part of the sport as well. Yeah. You know, when we talk about that, you know, the spot burning and sharing of information, there's like, there's like different types of information. There's like, there, there's kind of information to where you've kind of earned the right, according to somebody else, to, 
for them to share it with you. And that's either because you've shared information that was valuable to them and you gave, you brought something to the table and you shared something with, with someone that now, now you're kind of a trusted source. Like, okay, that guy, you know, he turned me on to this. Now he's asking a question. I feel like, okay, this is an even trade. Like there's a trade out of information. And, and that is like, uh, that's quite a bit different than just a, a newer angler or somebody that doesn't really know a lot, just expecting to get any kind of information for completely for free, like with no trade out, as opposed to kind of earning it and proving to someone that you're not going to be the one that just camps on that spot, or you're not going to be the one that, you know, just shouts it from the the highest mountain that, you know, whatever secret somebody's telling you is, is your idea and your, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, that's important to kind of keep in mind, I think, as, as we discuss this is that there is like a, there is a, an earned knowledge and an earned sharing. And I don't know, do you ever talk about that? Like in your, in your articles or, or in the comments online? I definitely agree with you. And I, and I do think we talk about that a little bit. Um, I think in this particular article, we were just saying like, here are some things you can do to not blow up your spot. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it funny though, um, how you can, you can have, you can start an article with great intentions like that. If here are five, five ideas you can, you can have to not blow up a spot. And the next thing you know, yeah. the internet's on, on fire with, like, <laughs> what do you, what do you mean? Why'd you write this article? It's like, oh man, it went totally. I'm not saying that your article went that way, but I yeah. can see how this subject could go that way, even under the best intentions, it it goes in a direction that you never expected, which I don't know if yours yeah. did or not, but it could. No, I, I enjoy those. I enjoy those topics. And when we, as when our, our editorial team sits down and we say, we're going to publish this, a lot of times we'll say, all right, well, guys, we're going to get backlash on this and this and this. Um, and I say like, it, as long as we have good intentions, I, I like, and I think our team enjoys at times some controversial topics and we could cover your plain yogurt, non-controversial topics all year and not have any, you know, arguing or backlash and comments or anything like that, but it, it wouldn't be as exciting. Uh, and I think it's important to cover some of these controversial topics. Well, it's also important to get other people's opinions. Like you can cater to one group and, and live in an echo chamber and, and discuss, you know, you're, there's no discussion. It's like, yeah, that's the way way to go guys. Great article. But, but <laughs> if you don't kind of present both sides of it, then I don't know that we, it, whether it's fishing or, or anything else, if you're progressing towards understanding that there are, that there are different sides and there are different opinions and you have to continue to have discussions and talk and so that you can understand what this other person is, is doing. And, and, Otherwise you just get really super upset. Like, I don't know, like a microcosm of the whole country right this minute <laughs> of just yeah, people, people don't talk, you know, they don't talk among, you know, they don't talk to the people that they disagree with. And the next thing you know, there's the, just, people are just so mad and that can happen in fishing too, over these spots. It can happen in fishing over, over lots of things like, but it, I don't know. I think, I think you have to, you have to present in a way, especially on a social media platform, you have to be welcoming of, of other ideas and uh, other opinions. Yeah. People can still hide behind their profiles with their opinions on social media. And I think that's what can make it a toxic place at times. Yeah. But I definitely agree with you. How do you deal with that? Like, that seems like you're, you're putting yourself squarely in the crosshairs of, of that toxic place at times and 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 in sometimes probably even even uh almost on purpose um other times totally accidental and then then there's this reaction that you don't expect how do you deal with you know that toxic environment that negativity and also the positivity we're lucky that it's not my, it's not me it feels like me sometimes um, but it's not, we're not this influencer or 
one person that people are calling out. Um, but I, I'm not going to lie. There's definitely times where there's negative comments that affect me personally. And, and cause I'm so attached to the, to the company and to the brand. Um, sometimes we'll just ban people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's days where I have less tolerance than others. Uh, if someone wants to be a total asshole and has zero good intentions, sometimes they'll just get a little ban and that's it. They don't get our content anymore. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, times where, you know, it's okay. You know, people can have opinions and as long as there's a sense of thought, that goes behind that opinion, even if it's against what we're, what we're thinking, that's totally fine. If someone is going to be an asshole for no reason, and there's no thought put behind it, uh, you know, there's, it's nice that we can ban people on, on these platforms. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, as you see, uh, like 2021 and beyond coming up, um, do you, do you, how do you see like conservation, uh, play in, into the the type of content that you create and we've we've touched on conservation already but <clears throat> do you have some specific agendas or some specific projects that 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 you see as something that that really needs to be addressed or or things being brought to your attention um yeah i mean that's a great question we're definitely we brought on two full time they're not full time but their focus is just conservation. Uh, and so they're a conservation editor. There's actually two conservation editors uh, and giving them the tools and allocating the right funds for them to put the right amount of time into highlighting these causes. Um, whether it's something that comes up in two months from now that Bonefish Tarpon Trust is fighting for down in the Keys, um, or if you know what we've seen with pebble mine comes back to haunt us all. And, and so I think as a voice for the the space and, and um, having the, the privilege of, of being a voice in the space uh, it's definitely really high on, on our priority list. Um, whether we're highlighting, you know, an organization of the month um, or like I said before, a specific project uh, you know, we're going to find c- continue to find creative ways to, share these stories and, and urge people to take action, um, when the time is right. And, you know, it's definitely really high on the priority list for us, um, this year. I can't think of anything like right now that we're, we're in the midst of fighting for, I think Pebble Mine is, is not completely over, Mm -hmm. but, uh, I know we've had some, some good wins, uh, recently, and that was definitely something we were putting some attention on, on. Yeah, that's great. So when you when you're bringing in a lot of new anglers to the sport, and then you have this kind of conservation uh, angle, do you see that the new anglers are embracing that and see the importance of it right away, or is that like a continuing education? Like where where do kind of new younger anglers stand on on that? I don't think it's a message that's going to ha- happen overnight. You know, maybe for some people, they they find passion in learning about how to protect these environments. But I think creating that connection to love fly fishing, love the sport, love your local water. That's such a powerful connection that, that we're trying to make first and foremost, and then conveying that message of, Hey, this place you love is in danger. It's, it's a much easier message to some of the, the younger anglers. Um, this is how you can take action. So I think first and foremost is like getting them out on the water and teaching them to love this environment and this water and these fish. And um, I think that's super important. And then telling them this is how we can protect, you know, these places. Nice. Well, that's super important, man. That, that is uh, that's, that's incredibly important to continue to grow the sport and get people into fly fishing, but get people into all types of fishing because you know, fishing and hunting, it's typically a sport that is passed down. And, uh, if it doesn't get passed down, it, uh, that's one of the beauties of social media. That is a way that people can get into the sport is seeing that other people are finding really cool things about this sport. Maybe it's something they want to try and then giving them a real pathway and avenue to, 
to uh, learn how to do it. That's that's super great. And then to wrap the conservation angle around it, I think that's super important. Um, how could uh, how could people, you know, support Fly Lords? Find you, find your your films and everything that we've uh, discussed today. And what what you know do what do they do? Is there like if you don't follow on social media, is there is there another way that that you uh, you follow Fly Lords? Sure. Yeah. So our, our website, um, where a lot of these articles are created is flylordsmag.com. There's still some guy in London with flylords.com that <laughs> wants $50,000 or something, but that's the website. Um, YouTube, uh, is where we're, we're going to be launching quite a bit of, uh, these films and, um, you know, working on, on growing that platform. Uh, but yeah, if you Google, uh, fly lords time into google uh it should pop up on youtube or or flip palette time um would love for you guys to check that out um and I, once again tom i really appreciate you shining some light on that it it's funny i i think of uh i mean that's probably half the reason i'm on here if not more <laughs> it's because you really enjoyed that film but um this this uh, crazy marketing guy gary v is always like one piece of content can change your life forever. And I think of the, uh, the dog face ocean spray TikTok guy who's like <laughs> famous now for that one viral TikTok video with, with that dream song in the background. And I'm not saying this is that piece of content for us, but it is cool to see like this little idea that one conversation with flip one little opportunity is, you know, can turn into being on this podcast with you and, and sharing, you know, more about our story and what we're doing with, uh, with a larger audience. So thank you so much again, um, for, for the opportunity. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Really enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, enjoying what you guys are doing and, uh, you're doing a, you're doing a really good job and, and really, really big compliments on the, on the time movie. That was, I, I enjoyed it thank and you. anybody would enjoy it. If you haven't seen it, you know, it's not like you gotta, you have to, uh, devote a tremendous amount of time to the thing. It's about seven or eight minutes long. <laughs> you can watch it, you know, instead of scrolling social media, you can watch this. And if you're somebody that likes fly fishing, you're somebody that, that, you know, lefty cray or flip palette or the combination of both were very impactful on your, your, you know, fly fishing or you're wanting to fly fish. And both of those two guys have probably had as big of an impact as, as hundreds of others combined, uh, on, on getting people into the sport and, and showing them really in a lot of ways, the right way to, to do things and, and, you know, to, you know, especially flip with his, with his, um, message of conservation and, and, uh, go into these super special places and then putting that on ESPN on Walker's K Chronicles. Um, you know, there's a ton of people that, that watch that every Saturday morning and decided that's not only is that something they want to do, but that's the life they want to live. And it, it spawned a lot of fishing guides and it had a big impact on me also. Um, but you know, just, just a good job. But if you, if you are into that and you're one of those people, you'll enjoy this movie. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not even really, I don't know if a movie is what you call it because that, that lends people to think that it's going to be like this two hour thing. It's a seven minute piece that is, is, is condensed and efficient and beautiful. And you should check it out for sure. Thanks, Tom. All right, man. All right. We'll be checking out Fly Lords and uh and and making all kinds of 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 comments behind the keyboard <laughs> <laughs> on our on our pseudo profiles but uh anyway yeah. thanks jared i appreciate it i like what you're doing and uh it was great great conversation thank you tom appreciate it all right see you